I belong to these groups. Uh, I actually also belong to Mothers Out Front, which they let non-mothers in, which is fortunate. <laughs> um, so we've done the housekeeping. Uh, there's more, more uh, information on the table. Um, when I talk about critical thinking, this is what I mean. So I, I think it's important to understand uh, what a speaker is talking about. So I, I, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about evaluating claims. That's the main uh, definition of critical thinking in the critical thinking community. Um, what are my own biases? And what do I value? And those things are important. It, it's, it's not just a cognitive thing. It's not just what you're thinking. It's what you're feeling. That's really important. So keep that in mind. Now, when I was a teacher, I used to do these things, uh, which I'm going to do now. And uh, a, a student told me, make us put our heads down, because I get influenced by what everybody else says. So I'm going to has, ask you to look at this list and decide which of these is closest to what you think. And then I'm going to have you vote on it. The reason for this is so I can get a handle of what the audience is like. But you have to close your eyes and put your head down. It's a little embarrassing, but you'll get over it. So which of these is closest to what you think? The Earth is warming. It's caused mostly by human activity. The Earth is warming, but it's a natural change in climate. The Earth is warming, but it's very small, so nothing to worry about. I don't know enough to make a judgment about it. The Earth is not warming. And climate change is a hoax by scientists and liberal activists. So you ready? You got to pick one of these. I'm going to total the things up. So um, closing eyes, heads down. Here we go. Want anybody looking now? One, the Earth is warming. It's caused mostly by human activity. You've got to keep your hands up so I can. OK, thank you. Two, the Earth is warming, but it's a natural change in climate. OK, thank you. Three, the Earth is warming. Oh, sorry. The Earth is warming, but it's very small, so there's nothing to worry about. Four, I don't know enough to make a judgment about it. Five, uh, the Earth is not warming. And my personal favorite, six, climate change is a hoax. OK, so thank you for doing that. Uh, it does give me an idea of um, who the audience is. So you're probably wondering how people voted. Um, so number two, it's easier to do it this way. Number two got 10 votes, uh, three got one, four got one, five got zero, and six got one, and all the rest were number one. So that tells me something. Do you have a handout, sir? No, I don't. OK. Um, well, that's very cooperative. What was the number for one? Uh, well, I think 30. 30? Yeah. OK. It, it was all the rest of the people, but I don't know how many. I, I sort of didn't do a very good job of counting. <laughs> OK. The goals of the presentation are that you'll better understand the problem of global warming and feel empowered, if you so inclined, to take actions as a citizen and consumer. And, and those reinforce each other a little different uh, about global warming, protect your loved ones. The main points I'm going to talk about are evaluating the evidence on global warming, evaluating cause and effect, possible objections to global warming concerns, personal biases and emotions, and then I'll switch over to some of the effects of global warming and global warming at the state level. I 
in our group, I'm the person who's focused on the state level. There's another person who's just, he's the lead person on uh, the national level. I'm not the lead person, but my focus is, is on the state level. <clears throat> this is Lena. Lena is our youngest granddaughter, and she is why I'm up here. She and all the other Lenas in the world, unborn and born, this is why I do this. I'm a retired, a retired history teacher. I don't get any money for it. I feel strongly about this. And the reason is that Lena has no voice. She doesn't get to vote on what we do. But she gets all the consequences. So I feel strongly that we should consider the Lenas of the world as we think about this issue of climate change. Keep that in mind. I'm not here alone. There's hundreds of millions of other people behind me that are affected by the decisions that we make. So I studied the Industrial Revolution. I had a sabbatical for a year to study the Industrial Revolution. I went to England. I know more useless information about the Industrial Revolution <laughs> than you believe. Um, but it's absolutely a good thing. It increased the standard of living in the world, certainly in the, Europe and, and the United States, dramatically. No, I'm not arguing that we should stop that. I'm arguing that we should transition. So keep that in mind. Increased standard of living, but we see there's problems with our energy use. It has, has side effects. So that's all I'm saying. And you can ask me questions afterwards about if you want to go into more detail. So let's start on the evidence. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Again, if you ask questions afterwards, I can, I can go into more detail. The evidence from IPCC reports, these are experts in, in the climate change field. Uh, they keep making more and more dire uh, pronouncements about uh, what's happening and what's going to happen. Uh, they do ice core sampling. So they're actually physically taking evidence out. They do computer modeling. And the way they do the modeling is they take a, a time period, let's say 1980, and, and they do it in, in 2000. They put the numbers into the computer, and they make a prediction. And then they look at 2000 and see how close they came. And then in 2001, they do the next year, and the next year, and the next year. These uh, predictions are getting more accurate, but they, they're often off. And they're almost always off on the low side. Their prediction, they keep getting surprised at how fast things are changing, faster than the models. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, they see the ice melting at the poles, and especially Greenland. Greenland uh, is on land. So when the ice melts, it, it has an effect on the ocean level. Um, biological changes, um, cherry blossoms, the Japanese have kept track of cherry blossoms for 150 years. And they can document that it's getting earlier every year, or every decade, I should say. Uh, they do ocean sample temperature testing. And they have more and more land and uh, satellite monitors. So they're getting more and more information uh, to, to pump into their um, models. This is my personal favorite. History is all about cause and effect. So I'm currently writing two booklets on the American Revolution, cause and effect. So this is like, this is in my wheelhouse. I love this stuff. Uh, so what do we know about this? Well, this is a, this shows the temperature uh, of the land ocean. And this lowest smoothing is just smoothing out the, the ups and downs. You can see it goes up and down here. It smooths them out. So you can see averages over five years. That's the point of that. And as you can see, it's going up. This is CO2, parts per million. And as you can see, it's also going up. And it's going up quite dramatically. That's a correlation. It doesn't mean that CO2 is causing 
the increasing temperatures. It might be that the increasing temperatures are causing CO2 or something else is causing both of them. So what do we know about that correlation? Well, ice core sampling shows that lower carbon dioxide happens when we know there were ice ages. So they go back and so they think that that shows that the correlation is stronger and stronger. The more you have, the more likely it is that, that the um, carbon dioxide that's trapped in the ice has something to do with um, the lower temperatures. But the other one is interesting is Mercury is closer to the sun, but Venus is warmer. Not a little warmer. It's a lot warmer. Um, and so it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and it, it changes a lot um, you know, on its rotation, but it's uh, average. Uh, Venus has a 97% CO2. When it had a 2%, it was 120 degrees. Now, logically, Mercury should be warmer. So that tells us maybe CO2 is a factor in how warm things are. How, how do we know that? How do we know which? Um, I, some study, I, I don't know. I read it somewhere. <laughs> okay. Now this, this is, a, again, just a logic thing. Uh, greenhouse gases come in, so that's this. They're coming in, that's the uh, incoming. And carbon dioxide is nearly transparent, and what that means is that its wavelength is short. So all of it, or almost all of it, goes right through. If there, if there is a CO2 blanket here, that's going through. The sunlight's going through. But when it comes back, it's thermal radiation. It has a larger lane, wavelength, and some of it bounces back here. Okay. What do you mean it's coming through? Well, w when we look outside, we see sunlight. That's radiation. That's not carbon dioxide. Right. It, and so the, the carbon dioxide is going through, and then some of it's blocked when it's radiated off the Earth. Okay? Um, okay, here's a question. Should the upper atmosphere, if there is a blanket here of CO2, should the upper atmosphere be warmer or colder? So some, some of this sunlight this uh, heat is being blocked and comes back to Earth. All right, so it should be colder, right? And that is what we see. So this, this is the temperature of the stratosphere is going down. So it, it, again, it's still a correlation, it, but it's like, gee, it's colder on the other side. So that seems to support the idea that it's the CO2 blocking it. But well, we don't have to go too far because in 1850s, John Tyndale did an experiment in a lab, which has been repeated many times, showing that CO2 absorbs heat. So we've known this for 170 years. We know that A causes B. CO2 causes temperatures to go up. Fascinating. Okay, possible objections. Global warming. So some people argue, well, you keep changing the name. First it was global warming and then it was climate change and you're just doing it for political reasons. Um, I can talk more about that. I'm only going to talk about two of these. Uh, the climate is always changing. Why is it so cold on some days or months? Climate change is a hoax. Very small increases in temperatures. Sunspots are causing it and China and other countries aren't doing as much. So those are some of the uh, objections. I'm only going to talk about two of them. If you want me to talk about the other ones, you can just ask during the question and answer period. I have this down to 40 minutes, and I, so that's why I'm doing it this way. First of all, weather and climate. Be careful about assuming any weather event is part, is, that shows a climate change. And this, both sides do this, right? So you just have to be careful. So when we look at dice, Two of the dice are normal temperatures. Just statistical probabilities on any day or week or month, it's going to be one third of a chance it's the same, one third of a chance it's colder, and one third of a chance it's warmer. 
right? So if, if it's colder one day, as James Inhofe did one time, he brought a snowball into the Congress and said, see, there's no global warming, right? Because it was cold and it snowed in Washington, D.C. Um, but all climate change does is change it from the odds of being colder two out of six to one out of six. You're still going to have some colder days. And then two are normal and three of them are warmer. And that is what we see over time. Just be careful about assuming that, oh, it's warmer here or colder here, that it's the same around the world. It's, and it's the same over years or decades rather than today. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the other is the Chinese and the Chinese. This, this argument makes people feel powerless. Like, why should we do anything? They're the ones emitting all the stuff. So this is, uh, this is their output. 29% of the Earth's emissions come from China. 16% come from the United States. We, we do have something to say about it. Uh, by the way, per capita, it's way higher in the United States than China. So we, we can do things. Um, this is, on the left, is their energy use. And they actually have been increasing uh, renewables, but there's no doubt about it. They, they use coal like crazy. It has dropped a little since 2013, uh, but they're a problem. We don't live there, so I, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, on the other side, we actually are making progress. So we have more renewables. We've cut down coal a lot, and gas has gone up, but the gas is less polluting than, than uh, coal. So that's, that's a good thing. In, in general, we're, we're making some progress. We need to, in my opinion, we need to make a lot more progress. But I don't think we should feel powerless. I think we should feel like, OK, there's things that we can do. OK, so we're talking about risk. We're talking about what are the threats to us. So I, I think this might be useful. I made this up last night. It was late. I was tired. Maybe it doesn't make sense. but. Um, if you think about risk, so if we take the first one, just ask yourself, would you pay this money for that risk? 2,000 to 10,000 people lost, a small economic hit, a 1% chance of that happening. Would you spend $44 billion out of the, the treasury, this is your tax money, to, to take care of that? Or you don't have to answer, just think about it. Uh, 10,000 to 50,000 people lost, a major economic hit, 1% chance, $100 billion a year, uh, 20,000 to 50,000 people lost per year. Not, not once, but per year, a 95% chance at $200 billion, or uh, 50 to 100,000. I kept playing with the numbers last night. So I made these up, right, um, based on a systematic wild guess. So people are lost, how? They die. Yeah, people die. I should have said die, huh? Yeah, stop using euphemisms. Ah, OK, so I mean, these are, these are threats to possible threats to our country. So well, what are they? Well, this is after 9-11. There was a possibility of terrorists um, you know, attacking our country 1%. If they got nuclear you know, waste or something, it could have been a lot more than that. Just an estimate. I completely support spending money to protect people that way. That's fine. The second one uh, is China. China is a, a competitor of ours now. And they've done things in the South China Sea, the elsewhere. So the Belt and Road Initiative and, and all that. So maybe we would end up getting in a fight with them. I hope not. And I'm fine with spending money on that. You, you probably can guess what the next two are. So this is if the. Uh, Earth warms by 2 degrees Celsius. Remember, that's Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Uh, there's a 95% chance, according to scientists. Suppose it's 80%. It's sure a lot more than 1%. And $200 billion a year uh, might be worth spending. And this is if it warms to 4 degrees. This is catastrophic. This isn't just some people dying and the economy taking a hit. This is a catastrophe that nobody wants. So keep that in mind, like risk assessment. 
Somebody may say, well, you don't know for sure. Absolutely. Dick Cheney said, we don't know if there's going to be a terrorist attack, but we have to operate on the assumption that there is going to be one. We've got to stop it. Well, we've got a much higher chance on climate change. And as you'll see, the national security people are all over this. They, they realize it's a problem. Okay, well, what if it is a hoax? Hope you can read that. <laughs> so if we go to this renewable energy transition, we're going to be better off in a lot of ways, as you'll see. It's certainly in medical, uh, asthma, things like that. So keep that in mind. Okay, so um, on, on the screen it says energy independence, preserves rainforest sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water. So there's a speaker up there who looks a little like me. He has glasses. Uh, and then somebody in the audience says, well, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Okay, so personal biases. I cut a lot out of this, but um, can't do everything. Um, so urgent problems need to, go, to get addressed. So if you're having trouble paying your bills, that's going to be your focus. And that's an inherent problem with climate change. It's not right this week. It's actually accelerating in my view, but it's, it's a long-term problem. And long-term problems uh, tend to be put off. They're not, they're not, okay, yeah, I get it. Uh, you might walk out of here, I get it, but I, I, gotta, I gotta take care of what's, you know, my own life going on. Um, and you can see it with prices. So here we have gas prices at 250 and then 329 and then 415 and now the frogs are going, whoa, we gotta do something. The gas prices are going up and ah, good drill, do something, Obama, what's wrong with you? Then it goes to 350, 279 and now they're back to, okay, it's cool. So people are very sensitive to prices of certain things and one of them is gasoline because we put the prices, we post them all over the place. Uh, and that's an issue that makes it difficult for people to think about climate change. They're interested in getting a dime off a gallon in, at their uh, gas station. Okay, so what are some of the effects of global warming? Well, you know about Australia. Um, that's uh, when the flames are coming into a town. And this is from a satellite. Look at the color of Australia. Um, and so they, they have the debate we're having. Uh, they, they've been back and forth on this. A lot of people saying, you know what, we really need to do something here. Uh, Australia added a new um, color because it had been 50 degrees Celsius is 122 Fahrenheit. They had never had one over 122, and they had to add a new, uh, a new color up to 129 because they started having ones above 122. I don't know if you've ever been out. I've been out uh, in August in 108 degrees. You don't want to stay out there for four, more than a few minutes. It's terrible. This is 100, over 122 degrees they're having. Something's going on here. Okay, this is the... Ice in Greenland. Again, Greenland and Antarctica are important to sea level. Uh, the Arctic is not so much. Okay? Greenland is having ice melts. So to, to interpret the graph, this is um, uh, winter, summer. Winter, summer. So in winter there's more ice, in summer there's less ice. But I think you can see the trajectory. And in 2012, this is one of the things that surprised uh, scientists. There was an ice melt that was unprecedented. They'd never seen so much ice over the course of a year. Now this graph only goes up to 2016 or 17. Um, in August of 2019, so last August, they had the largest single ice melt in recorded history in Greenland. It increased the ocean level 
by 0.02 or 0.03, depending on what, what source you look at. The entire ocean in one month went up by 0.02. That's a year would be 0.2 and a decade would be two inches from an ice melt. Now, it's not going to do that, but hopefully. Uh, but th that gives you an idea why some people are kind of concerned about this. What's the scale on the left? Uh, it's, uh, I got to read it. Oh, I can see it. Monthly change in uh, kilometer mass and it's uh, gigatons. Okay, thank you for asking. Okay, the permafrost is melting throughout. The, this is in northern hemisphere. So this is Canada and Alaska and Russia. Uh, it's melting and uh, so it's not permafrost anymore. It melts periodically, and when it does, methane is released into the atmosphere, and methane is 86 times more potent. It doesn't last as long as CO2, but it's a potent greenhouse gas. So that's not good. Uh, the war in Syria. Before the war broke out, people in the State Department, we know this from WikiLeaks, uh, were saying there's a drought, there's going to be problems in Syria. And it's the same in Yemen. I didn't include that slide, but. Um, the, these drought is related to these. You have farmers going into cities. They're not employed anymore. They're struggling. You're going to have problems. So that is related to uh, climate change. Okay, this is a uh, question. Okay, this is a uh, interesting thing. So this is uh, you see this China, India, this is Pakistan. Pakistan depends on uh, this river. Um, this is the Indus River um, for 80% of its farming. Now, these blue things are glaciers, and they are melting. In the short run, that's good. They're melting, so the rivers are flowing, and it's okay, so things are okay. Eventually, they're going to stop. They're going to slow down, and then, so over a 30 year, 50 year period. And India, you may know this, uh, doesn't like Pakistan. And they, this is a, a contested area, Kashmir. And they may dam up the river, in which case these guys are going to be what we call in the jargon, angry. <laughs> and that could cause trouble. But these guys are also interested in this. And they may dam the river up up here, in which case these guys are going to get angry. This, this, is a, there, this is a large portion of the population of the Earth is dependent on the rivers that flow out of the Tibetan Plateau. And if the scientists are correct, this is going to end up in wars. They're going to fight over it. This is Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, is mostly at, about half the country is at sea level. Sea level rises, half these people are going to go somewhere. Like 40 million people are going to go somewhere. You think they're going to go to India? They built a fence all the way around. They're not going to let these people in. So you're going to get more and more instability in this region of the world. And I, I don't have any slides on Africa. I mean, it's, it's different in different places. Uh, but this is, this is a very serious uh, problem, potential problem. Um, in our own country, the fire season is now 105 days longer than it was in the 1970s. If you talk to people in the West, they'll say, yeah, it's different. It's, it's just, the fires are amazing. Um, okay, so let's talk about national security. So this is the largest naval base in the United States, Norfolk. And it has dry docks. And these dry docks have been in danger of flooding because the uh, storms are worse. So scientists predicted that if they're right about climate change, there'll be the same number of hurricanes. Won't be any more hurricanes than normal. So it'll go up and down in the, the pattern. But the hurricanes, there'll be more large hurricanes. So there'll be more damage. Uh, if you think about Hurricane Sandy, 300,000 homes. That is a lot. Um, the subways were completely flooded in New York City. So the, the storms are, are getting worse. Uh, there's not more of them. And one of the places it's getting worse is in Norfolk. And they had a submarine in the dry dock. And they were thinking about splitting it in half and taking it out because of the threat 
of the flooding. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to protect our, our national security assets. Uh, this is a 2014 quadrennial defense review. The impacts of climate change may increase the frequency, scale, and complexity of future missions. And then uh, the pressures caused by climate change will influence resource competition while placing additional burdens on economies, societies, governing institutions around the world. These effects are threat multipliers. They're seeing that India and, and uh, Pakistan may fight over water. Uh, they're already seeing it in Yemen. They, they had uh, three aquifers and two of them dried up. What do you think is going to happen? So uh, as is normal in American history, the national security people are ahead of the curve. They're already seeing things that we don't think about because they get paid to think about those threats. So this is a big national security um, problem. How about locally? So uh, this is Winthrop. We, we uh, pay a lot of attention in our group to Winthrop because the Speaker of the House is in Winthrop. And nothing passes unless the Speaker uh, says it's OK. And they had two enormous floods in 2016. Uh, this is one of them. And you'll notice I note the irony, the green energy truck running through a flood. Um, so uh, it, it's local also. Uh, somebody was telling me that her husband in Plum Island had a house on Plum Island, and he lost everything. He tried to sell it, and he had to put his um, retirement into selling the house. Uh, if you're on the coast, you might want to think about that. Um, or if you're inland a couple miles, you might want to think that you'll have oceanfront property eventually. <laughs> okay, so here I'm going to try and, because I want to make it show, let's see now. I think I'm okay here, but bear with me. Come on, baby. Okay. Why? Okay, I'm getting there. That's the wrong one. Where's the, uh, oh, I, oh, okay. I closed the one I wanted. Oh, no. How am I doing on time? You never worry about time. Yeah, you'll walk out of here at 1030. I know what you're like. <laughs> uh, I need to reopen that tab. History. This one. See what I did there? Yeah. I think I, I, think I almost solved the problem. Come on. Jeez, I had it all set up and I hit close. Oh, I hate it when I do that. I wonder if we should also make sure that you're on our wall. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I don't want, I want to do that. Okay. I think I'll, I'll just... Uh, Okay, so how do I bring this back up? Oh, I'm on there. How do I? You're probably on one of these. This guy. Come on, baby. Never should have done that. Well, you never know. Um, I want to see if there's a resume. Oh, present it's on presentation. Yeah, it's on it's presentation. On. I don't understand why it's not coming. Try this. Good job. Boom. Okay. All right. Take a sedative. All right. I think I'm okay. All right. So unfortunately, I can't pull up. There's a flood map of Beverly. And in 15 years, um, if there was a... Her uh, doesn't sound as good when you don't have the slide up there, but... Um, there could be three feet of water in a coming center. It ha actually has done that uh, once before. So th those would be more frequent. Um, again, if, if you, uh, I think it's on your handout, you could go to the flood maps and take a look and see where you live uh, and, and check it out. So unfortunately, I thought I could do this, but I overestimated my skills. OK. So what can we do as consumers and citizens to reduce global warming? So it's both consumers and citizens. So 
I want to first talk about consumers. Um, these are options, and they're not. I, di I didn't make these up. Uh, it was a, another one of my colleagues that made this up. You could switch your insurance if it's underwriting fossil fuels. You don't necessarily even have to switch it. All you have to do is call them up and say, "Do you support? Does some of the money go that you have go for fossil fuels?" Or you can call your bank up and ask them, because that makes them think, "Wow, people are sensitive about this. Maybe maybe we should think about it." And so consumers matter. That's how capitalism works. Um, you could change your bank. And, and uh, in previous presentations, people said, "Yeah, I called up afterwards. I called up my bank, and turns out they support fossil fuels." So, I, so you'd be surprised sometimes. Um, you could choose wind power for your electricity. You could shop secondhand, so you're not, you know, feeding the consumer. But that's up to you. This is an interesting one. You could go into a car comp, you know, a car dealer that you know doesn't have electric cars and say, "Do you have any electric cars?" Because then they'll go back to the manager and say, "Hey, people are asking about electric cars, so that's that's up to you." And you could buy carbon offsets, which I'll talk more about uh, in a minute. So those are some possible things. At the um, citizen level, I want you to think about what's costing you already. So think about it as as an individual, and let's take. This guy, let's call him Dwight. Uh, and what's it costing him? The, the point about climate change legislation is, hey, it's going to cost me money. Well, guess what? It's already costing you money. So let's take a look at this. So there's subsidies to oil, gas, and coal. And so he's paying that. Um, and they, I looked some of these up. They're amazing. You'd have to be a tax lawyer to understand, like, okay, we had R and D for drilling and low cost leasing and uh, intangible drilling costs. Like, okay, so they get they get that. And as near as I can tell, it's costing him. And I try pick the lowest. So I took. Here's how I did this. <laughs> I took the amount of the subsidies and divided it by 138 million taxpayers. So that's how I arrived at this. The problem is that the estimates of the subsidies are way different. So one has 20 billion, another one has 6 billion, and so who knows. Uh, it's not nothing. It's costing us money to pay these subsidies. Uh, something on the order of $600 billion since World War II. We have a huge fossil fuel industry. We're the leading producer uh, of oil and natural gas, not natural gas, but oil. Uh, so we're, you know, we're paying, should we be paying for those? I think that's something to think about. But then there's the cost of the pollution. You see what I did there? I made the dollar bill bigger. <laughs> so health costs, you might not have asthma. But your insurance is higher because other people are getting it. And there's been a spike in asthma in Massachusetts in the last couple of years. So you're paying for extra costs for these people, for, for the pollution. And, and by the way, it hits people that are poorer more than wealthier. Right? So that, that's something to consider. Uh, it's costing you for fire, flood, drought. Um, and, and you know about this, uh, the, hurricane, uh, the rainstorm in Houston. That cost us money. Hurricane Sandy cost us money. This, this is, it's costing us money for these, uh, these storms and the droughts and all that. Now, these uh, insurance, I did my best. I just couldn't figure out how to calculate anything. Uh, but we're paying for uh, crop insurance for farmers. Uh, and they're getting flooded more often, but how do you know how much of it is due to climate? I have no idea. So I wasn't going to, I might have tried, but I decided not to. And then national security, and again, how much of our national security is going for climate change things? Some of it is because I've read about the uh, Norfolk Naval Base. Like they're paying money to shore it up. Some people think that eventually we'll have to close the base, it won't be uh, habitable. After a while, it's on a peninsula, so it's uh, it could be in trouble. So 
But you might be asking, yeah, well, what's the subsidies for the renewables? And that is a good question. So I looked it up. I, it's down in the corner here. I don't know if you can see it. But um, I, I took the amount. And again, this is in dispute. It, it comes out to about $43 a year. And I will freely admit, when there's subsidies, there's going to be some waste. There's going to be waste. And the question is, are you willing to pay your tax money for this? because you're already paying tax money for all these. So the question is, what's the role of subsidies here? You, as you'll see, I don't argue necessarily for subsidies. I'm arguing for something else. If they cut the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, I will throw a party. <laughs> so here are some options. We could do nothing, plant trees, Subsidize nuclear power, subsidize innovation, new technology, regulate emissions from fossil fuels. So, and I put what those are in parentheses, so every time I say fossil fuels, it's those. Charge fossil fuels uh, for the full cost of pollution, subsidize solar and wind power, subsidize carbon capture. This is different than forests, this is technology to capture that use fans and stuff, whatever those scientists uh, say about it. Um, Emphasize efficiency in homes and buildings, subsidize trains and pub public transportation, and stop subsidizing fossil fuels. So I want you to take a minute and turn to the person next to you and talk about which of those do you think, and if you don't know the person, you might want to say, hi, I'm so-and-so from wherever, uh, and talk about which of those things do you think you, we should do. And it might, if, if you do number one, then you don't have to discuss anything else. Because of, <laughs> okay, go ahead. So you talk, talk to your partner there. Are we going to have more than one vote? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can vote for several things. You can vote for four or five. I don't care. That's fine. Yeah, you keep clarifying things for me. Thank you. Wait. Is that the right time? What's the time? Yeah. 10 after 10? Yes. 10 14? Oh. 10 14. Oh dear. Okay, stop. I didn't do that right. What I should have said is you have 10 more seconds, but okay. That's what I used to do as a teacher. Okay, so I have to run through some of these. But it's, it's interesting to think about what you would favor. Uh, if you do nothing, you can't hardly see that up there. Um, some people estimate that over time it will cost us five trillion, uh, one trillion to four trillion dollars of national income per year. That's the threat, right? Uh, so th uh, that's five percent to twenty percent of national income. So just something to think about. So I'm going to run over. I can't do this. I, it breaks my heart. There's, MIT did a study of these various options, and I just don't have time, and then I'd have to get out of the thing. I think I can show you the slide at the end if I have one minute left. Um, OK. Basically, the underlying problem is our group sees it. This is Citizens Climate Lobby, is that it's unfair competition. And everything else you do doesn't matter as much as equalizing the competition. We believe in capitalism, but we want a fair competition. So as we've said, the uh, fossil fuel industry is not charged for the damage to the environment, and it gets subsidies. So if we equalize those, that might be uh, a good way to do it. Now, if we do nothing, that lets the problems get worse, as you saw. And what does the next generation think about that? Uh-oh. <laughs> Not good. They don't like it. Um, so if we put a price on carbon, then it would equalize the market, and people would be able to choose which one they think is cheaper, basically, because right? it would be already factoring in the effects on the environment. So that's, that's what we favor. Uh, you get to make the choices, efficient market mechanism, investments are directed at the most profitable areas. Somebody was talking to me on the way in about innovation. You get more innovation if you have a higher price on fossil fuels because the people that innovate make more money. So they will 
go to that area. That's how capitalism works. I think I said that before. Um, the subsidies increase demand for fossil fuels because they lower prices on everything. That's a problem. <clears throat> okay, this uh, carbon pricing has been endorsed by 3,300 uh, economists, one of whom was George Bush's chief of economic advisors. He is a big fan of this. A lot, so this is a nonpartisan group. Republicans and Democrats agree, economists agree, that this is the, a really good way uh, to, to deal with this issue. If we did, the price did increase, these institutions uh, would, so this is Beverly Hospital and the Cummings Center in Salem State, they would, they'd pay attention. You know, a 5% increase in their heating bills will get them to do that, and we know this because in British Columbia, the University of British Columbia switched over its heating system because the price went up. The, the price went up and they said, oh my gosh, OMG, we gotta do something. Okay, in Essex County, this is from 2018, 73% favor a carbon tax, 68 nationally. 70% uh, of people agree that corporations do more to curb it, curb it and 69% agree that citizens should do more to curb greenhouse gases. This is in our county. So people, we think, are switching. And our evidence is, look at the number of people in this room. We would not have had this three or four years ago. There's a lot of people here. And at Beverly High School on January 6th, we had 140 people. We thought we were going to have 40. So uh, people are paying attention. We can do something about this. So I only have time to talk about, well, I was only going to talk about this one anyway, which is the price on carbon. If you want to ask me afterwards about uh, any of these, you can. But I'm just going to talk about H2810. The problem is that carbon pricing hurts people. Their, their heating bills go up. Their gas goes up. And that's, if you live paycheck to paycheck, that's not really great. You're, you're going to be upset, and it's going to make it harder for you to, to make ends meet. But what if we could cut the emissions without hurting them? So this is a carbon fee, or tax if you prefer, and rebate. Uh, and what it does is rebate 70% back on a per household basis. Not on how much energy you use. Per household, keep that in mind. Uh, and then 30% goes the other. So here's how it works. You take the average, this is where the quiz comes in. Pay attention. Uh, you'd pay, let's say, an extra $18 a month, and we know that if 30% goes to this other thing, that's five, and so 13 per month are rebated per household. So you paid in 18, you're getting 13 back. Got it? So that, that costs, so let's do the quiz. You ready? If you spend 18, what's your rebate? Okay, this is the hard part. If you spent 90, what's your rebate? Stumped you. What's your rebate? 13. If you're 1, if you go from 90 to 1, what's your rebate? You still have incentive to switch. No matter what you do, you're going to get whatever the number they arrive at at the end of the year. They're going to give these rebates in December and June, before the heating season and before the cooling season. So that's, that's the idea of this bill. I do this because people say, well, if you, if you give the money back, people don't have incentive to switch. Oh, they do. Because the money's getting redistributed from those who use a lot of energy to those who don't. So you, you, your furnace goes, you're going to go, whoa, it's costing me more money for, I'll get the heat pump instead of uh, an oil burner. Okay, now this will help people. This is the cost. Uh, sorry, this is the cost, and this is the rebate. So these rebates are greater than the cost increase, so people up to $67,000 will end up not just getting a rebate for some of it, they'll end up with more money they, than they started with. So it will help uh, people at the low end. Remember, people at the low end also g get the biggest hit from carbon pollution, right? And these people have resources to switch. So that's the idea behind it. The Green Infrastructure Fund goes to cities and towns. 
uh, we are especially concerned about renters. They can't buy solar panels. But if you put in community solar, if Beverly is putting one in, to, in the uh, dump, which is a good use of the dump, I think, um, then you can buy the solar panels in your community. And we can help people at the low end of the income scale. So that, that's a, a, a big plus. And then uh, electric buses and, and uh, other things locally. Um, we import 100% Massachusetts from Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Pennsylvania that beat us in the Super Bowl, and Texas, which we defeated in 2018. $20 billion a year. So we could, if we put a, a fee on that and then rebate it back to people, uh, we're going to be creating jobs here instead of feeding jobs in those hostile territories. So think of it more as an opportunity. Not just, oh no, we have to do this. This is an opportunity. We'll get more jobs than we have now because these jobs will be here in Massachusetts. We'll be better off that way. Obviously, health will go up and entrepreneurs will, hey, let's go to Massachusetts. So again, I think like a history teacher, I think of when the Industrial Revolution started. People said, oh no, we can't do that. If we do that power loom, we're going to lose all kinds of jobs. This is terrible. So the Luddites went out there and destroyed the equipment. Right? 1920s, biggest opposition automobiles, wagons. The wagon industry is going to, we're going to crucify the wagon industry. So you have to think about the transition. If Massachusetts becomes a green economy, we still want energy. We still want growth. We still want you to you know, buy the consumer products you want. I don't, I don't want to change your lifestyle except to conserve and, and not be polluting the atmosphere. We're going to still have growth. That's how I see it. OK. Uh, it works in British Columbia. They've been doing it for more than a decade, and it's worked fine. It works in Denmark. Uh, and we have it in Reggie. These states have cut emissions, uh, electric electricity emissions by 50%. If you have these um, energy efficiency and the they national grid and Eversource come in and, and they'll help you to, to do If you haven't, you should do it. Uh, it's really great. That's because of Reggie. They are mandated to do this because of the extra money. So uh, sometimes I get frustrated. <laughs> but Is that you 20 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> That's the day before yesterday. Uh, but I want you to think about dominoes, not that dominoes, uh, these dominoes. So if we pass carbon pricing in Massachusetts, that will knock over the domino, which may lead to the country adopting carbon pricing, which may lead to the world adopting. And you might say, oh no, I'm a little skeptical here. But think about civil rights and women's rights and health care. They started in states, or they started in actually just a few people. I feel like I can make a difference. And I want you to feel that you can make a difference. It's hard as an individual, but if you join organizations, then you got other people who have other skills, and you can make a difference that way. We are not powerless on this. Americans have like a whole history of solving problems. This is who we are. We can make a difference here. It's not that we're going to say there's either climate change or no climate change. It's how much. And we can make that number come down. That's what we're here for. These, uh, these are on your sheet. Um, these are our local uh, representatives. Uh, I have seen him so many times that uh, he, he knows me very well. Um, and these are our officials, but the highest office in the country is the office of citizen. We control what happens. We need to be involved, and, and we can make a difference. And why would we do that? For our grandchildren. Thank you. <laughs>